Transformation House. Are y'all ready for the word on today? Are you excited about Jesus on today? Yes. Man, I tell y'all when, I say this all the time because Easter has became more and more and more important, important and intimate into my life because I remember when I was a kid, like Easter was all about getting a new Easter outfit for church and for after church. Like that was all in my alley. And like drilling that Easter speech in my head for weeks because I'm, I'm such that, I was that nerd that wanted to be the best one to get up there and say my Easter speech the best way possible. However, as I became older and I realized what Easter and what this Resurrection Sunday means in my life, I am just, I prob if, if I cried a lot, I probably would cry. <laughs> but it really, it, just knowing that Jesus died on a cross for me and he got up from a grave for me, for my life, for everything that I've been through and for everything that I'm going through and his last words on that cross was, it is finished. And in so many areas of our life today where we don't apply those simple words, it is finished. And so on today, as our lead pastor here at Transformation House, Pastor Tony Moore, comes forward and he preached this word that I'm so excited about because I know it applies to my life and I know it applies to your life and I can't wait to let it out to the whole world. So would y'all help me welcome our lead pastor here, Pastor Tony Moore. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you in the church this morning. Wow, everybody looks great. Good stuff, Tim. Good job. <laughs> you know what I like about Easter? You know why I just love Easter? Why? Tell us. Thank you. <laughs> you know you have to talk back. Peeps. Easter Peeps. <laughs> peeps. Yes. We've had peeps all week. And jelly beans and all that good stuff. I love Easter candy. I love anything that's just close to straight sugar as you can get. <laughs> right. I don't need the chocolate and all that other mess, nuts and all that. I mean, I like it and I'll eat those too, but I like just the plain sugar. Anyway, no, that's not the reason I like Easter. Well, it's not the main reason I like Easter. <laughs> I like Easter because I get to come to church every Easter and share it with my family, with friends, and um, no, that's not the reason either. But I like that part. In fact, um, man, I just, y'all look so good. <laughs> You know, um, we have to do this, right? Hold on. Hold on. Can it shots? <laughs> oh, wait. Okay. Y'all, y'all, just run over here just for a second. Right, right in the middle. We're going to do this. Selfie. Selfie. Well, I can't miss you. Oh, are you in? You're not in. Oh, oh. Jen, come over this way. I'm gonna swing it around to the knees. They're right in. Yeah. Oh, where's the button? Okay, here we are. Gotcha. <laughs> You'll be watching Ellen tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think she would let us on. You know the real reason I'm really excited about Easter is because everything that Christianity is is based on this. This is the bottom line. This is the whole foundation of everything that we believe. And let me tell you that if there's anything else that's attached itself to the definition of Christianity and what living for Jesus is, that's just baggage and you can let it go. Because this is what Christianity really is. So if this is what Christianity really is, what is it? Do you know? Not the new clothes. Not the peeps. 
Jesus, Jesus rose. Jesus rose. And more. It's that, but it's more. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. He did. It's more. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Then there's more. <laughs> what? <laughs> Who's it? He's still alive. He's still alive. And? He did it for us. He did. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> it never ends. There's always more. The real bottom line is this. And it's always been God's plan from the very beginning. And that is life. After death. Life. Life. It's life. Do you remember um, the very first argument that's recorded in the Bible? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. That's way back there. Just the third and fourth people listed there, so we had to be somewhere around that story, right? Okay, before that. <laughs> the, very, the very first argument in the Bible was about life. Because Adam and Eve were created, placed in the Garden of Eden, and God says, you can have it. You can live. You can be free. You can do anything you want to except this one thing. What was the one thing? <laughs> Don't eat from that tree. That one right there. And Eve's just kind of walking by one day and she hears this voice. <laughs> you can really eat it. God said, Don't eat it because if you eat it, you're going to die. And the servant said to Eve, Nah, you're not going to die. You'll just live and be like God. You won't die. And so there's this argument in the beginning that God had set in place life. And he didn't want anything for Adam and Eve or for anything in creation except to live and to flourish, thrive. And then that voice, and you've heard it, when God's offering you life and you hear the other voice that says, There's this other life over here. And so from the very beginning, there's been this conflict, and it's not, it's not between good and evil, because that was on the same tree in the garden, right? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the same tree, but it was this life tree over here. This tree of life. And so um, what happened to them? What did Adam and Eve do? They ate it, and what happened to them? <laughs> okay, and 900 years later, what happened to them? <laughs> okay, they died, we got it. This was also, um, God didn't change his plan just because man didn't accept his offer of life. He didn't change the plan, it was still his plan. I want to give you life, I want to give you life. I want to give you life. And here's the way to live. And if you if you remember the story of Moses and the children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, in, be, they had become enslaved. And God sent Moses to deliver them from bondage and from the existence that they had so that they could live a free life again. God still offered them life. And he says, I've got a, this place that you can have, this promised land. And you can go there. And I want to read to you what God said to them. It's kind of a different um, Easter uh, scripture today from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 30, uh, starting in verse 11. God is telling them now that, you know, they've had their 40 years in the wilderness and they're about to enter into this promised land that God gave them. And this is what God says to them in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 30. He says, now, what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult to, for you. Okay, now listen to this. Because this is what I mean when I say, if somebody has put anything else onto the definition of Christianity, that's baggage that you can let go. Because living for Jesus is not hard. It's not burdensome. 
is not something that should weigh you down. What I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven, so you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we can obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea and get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? No, this word is very near you. It is even in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. Can I tell you what that means? That means that the law, thank you. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, that means that the gift that Jesus offers us, this life that he has for us, is already in our hearts. We already want it. Sometimes we don't know we want it. Somebody already said that this morning, didn't they? That even before, I think Kristen said, that even when we didn't realize that we needed rescuing, God rescued us. We don't even know sometimes what that, what that pull is, what that desire is in our heart. But this is what it is. It's the desire to be able to just live without the weight. To be able to live free. And this is what God is saying. It's already in your mouth. You're already asking for it. It's already in your heart. You're already longing for it. So see, I set before you today life and prosperity or death and destruction. For I command you today, this is how you find it, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commands, decrees and laws, then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to possess. Now they're on the very edge of this promised land and God's telling them, this is how you're going to thrive when you get there. So he says, but if your heart turns away and you're not obedient and if you're drawn to other gods and to worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. So he says, now I have put these two choices in front of you. Life and prosperity, or death and destruction. And this is the way to get whichever one you choose. In verse 19, he says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what God is saying to his people. Now, they've been in bondage. They've not, when I say in bondage, I mean as slaves. To the Egyptians, Egyptians. And he's offering them the complete opposite of what they have experienced their whole life. They've lived in bondage all this time. They've lived under um, the, the rule of some other man who had his thumb on them and who controlled them and who told them where they could go and what they could have and where they would live and how they would live. Now, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you something different, the opposite of that. I'm going to give you freedom and life and prosperity. He says it right here in this verse. I offer you life and prosperity. So what did they do? Do you know? They accepted his life offer for a while. And then, just as he told them, they started listening to the other voices, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. They started listening to the other offers, but, you know, this really isn't so great. It's not so great after all, is it? You really should, um, you really should do your own thing instead of really submitting your life to God. And eventually, they went, um, they disobeyed God and went into bondage again. Well, 
it's easy for us to look back thousands of years ago and say, if I had been there, I would have done it differently. If I had been in the Garden of Eden, I would never have listened to that snake. I would never have taken a bite of that fruit. And if I were Adam, I never would have listened to Eve. Right? Right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Now you went to sleep. <laughs> but we know in our own lives that we've made similar choices. We've listened to that voice instead of listening to the voice of God. We have not always chosen life. And sometimes it wasn't our choice. Sometimes it was stuff that happened to us. Things that other, just like, I mean... Israel was in bondage because of things that their parents and grandparents had done. Not necessarily their choice, but they were born into slavery because of the bad choices that their parents made. The same thing happens to us, right? Some of us are living with the effects of the choices of our parents. Some of us are... are maybe living now in a relationship that's abusive or um, that's filled with violence or alcoholism or what lots of things. We all know what death is in our lives, right? We know, we know the effects of death. We're intimately familiar with death. I have a pile of leaves in my backyard that remind me that in the winter time, leaves die and fall off a tree. And if you don't get them up, they'll still be there, <laughs> reminding you death, death, death. I, I've spent um, a lot of time in the past few weeks in cemeteries. Not my favorite thing to do. Um, but every time I look at a marker, I see the marker of a person, young or old, and it reminds me that life is short and, and we're here for a season and then death is inevitable. It happens to all of us. Um, the first week of November, my mother's doctor told her that, or told us that um, she might have six months left with us. Um, she suffers from dementia and she's always been mobile and talking, um, but the last several days she's stopped eating and it looks like the doctor's timetable is pretty close. Um, that six months will be over at the end of April. <coughs> Her body is very weak and she's not responding very well, but Judy and I were there. Um, some of you got to meet Judy's family who were visiting from Ohio last weekend and we took them over to see my mom and dad for a little while Thursday. <clears throat> my mom was in bed the whole time. She hadn't been up all day. She hadn't eaten anything all day. She weighs like 82 pounds, very frail, and usually doesn't know anybody. <clears throat> um, we got ready to leave, and Judy and I were standing by her bed, and she hadn't responded very much at all. She, she did look up and smile when Judy came and talked to her. She loves Judy. Um, <laughs> I'm blessed that way that my mom and my wife became best friends in the past 20 years that we've been back here in Greenville. But um, she wasn't saying anything, so we turned to walk away. And she said, don't just turn around and leave me. And um, so you know, we went back, of course. Not going anywhere, we're right here. And um, so I bent down and gave her a kiss on the cheek, and she said, Did I give you a hug? And um, I said, Not yet. So, and she couldn't move. Um, you know, I just bent down and, and took her and, and hugged her, and she turned her, her face and kissed my cheek. And then she had to give Judy a hug too. And um, it was a, it was a, a sweet moment, uh, a reminder, though, that. Death is coming, and that at some point there will be a final kiss, a final hug, a final goodbye, and um, we're really intimately familiar with that part of our lives. We're, we know how death stings, 
We know the pain of that. We know the pain of losing. Um, all you have to do is listen to the news and you see that death is everywhere from wars or violence or crime, um, suicide. So much. Every time you listen to the news, you hear another story, even local news. You don't listen to a local newscast without hearing somebody was killed in an accident or, or was murdered or took their own life. Um, death surrounds us and we're so familiar with it. But why aren't we more familiar with life? Why aren't we more familiar with the gift that God offers us? Why don't we hear more life-giving stories? What we call living, I think, is sometimes just existing. We're just getting older to the point that we're going to die. And we call that life. And it's not really much life to it. We're getting through this day. And we suffer all the pain and the heartache. And then we hope we get to another day. And then the next day, is, we're hoping it's going to be better. And sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. But it's just, we're so burdened down with dying instead of really living. Some of you probably have heard your whole life how worthless you are. And every day, that affects you. You go about your life assuming that because you've been told you have no worth, that you have no worth. You listen to that... You listen to that voice that tells you that nobody cares. You listen to the voice of the enemy that is constantly trying to belittle you. Um, some of you have maybe made poor choices and got you into relationships and you don't know how to get out of them and you wish you could. And you constantly just hear the, there's no hope, it's not going to get better. Some of you probably have been burdened with religion and judgmental people who are constantly pointing at you and, and telling you that you need to measure up to some standard that you don't meet yet and, and you know in your heart that that standard you will probably never meet. Well, I can tell you something about that standard from judgmental people. It's always man-made. It's always a false idol. And it's part of something that you can let go. But so many times we, we feel like I, I can't, well, I don't know where to turn. I can't turn to my friends because they say I'm worthless. I can't go to my family because they're always belittling me. I can't go to God because I don't measure up to this religious standard. I, personally, um, as a victim and survivor of childhood sexual abuse, I know what it's like to live every day of your life wondering who you are. Am I really that person that can only be used? Am I really the person who has to let other people control me? The first 40 years of my life were lived every day hearing those voices. Every day I heard that other side, and, and it wasn't life-giving. It was killing me. The whole time, Jesus was offering me life. My head was filled with the other voices that said, you will never experience that kind of life. The result of all that, I believe, is that we live on this downward spiral that continually gets worse. We get lower. It never improves. It always gets worse. We recycle all the garbage that's been heaped on us. We rehearse all the words, all the labels that people have put on us. We keep hearing those voices over and over again. But I want to tell you something. That's not living. That's existing. There's something better. And in spite of all your attempts to overcome any of that kind of stuff, 
in spite of your attempt to be good, in spite of all your trying to pull yourself up, make yourself better, at the end of the day, you still feel that weight. In spite of the accusations that have been leveled against you, and in spite of all the shame that you feel, I can tell you what the bottom line is. The bottom line is that you have been judged. That a judgment has been made against you. It's true for all of us. A judgment has been made against us. Even, even for those of us who accomplished some goal and met some standard, and we have some religious resume that we can show off. In spite of that, you've still been judged. The finger has still been pointed in your direction. No matter how good or how bad you've been, judgment has taken place and you've been found guilty. There's a, there's a story in, in, the, in Jesus' crucifixion story. There's a man that, that plays a role here um, that you may not think very much about when you think about Easter. Um, but I think it's really pivotal for us to turn our attention away from death to life. And I want to tell you about what it meant when Jesus said, it is finished. Remember, on the cross, the last words Jesus breathed out were, it is finished. Before we talk about that, I want you to watch this video. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free? Open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We, we want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent, for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. 
No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. When I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. That's me. That's you. That's us. And I felt I was reading this the other day, and I felt God speak to me. I love Barabbas. I love him. But God, he's bad. Man, I love him. And I wanted him to go free. But didn't you know that he probably would have never acknowledged the free get? Yeah, but I love Barabbas. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves them. And the nerve, the call, the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I'm going to work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do? I'm going to shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin. You will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No! God, I say, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God and it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive. Let me have your sin, son. Okay. When I give him my sin, I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were gonna set ourselves free? 
it's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If His blood is sufficient for your salvation, His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough! That's why His offer is so good to, for us and to us. Jesus came to make this choice easy. John 19 and Matthew 27 tell the story of Jesus on the cross in the final moments of His life. And it says that He cried with a loud voice. John tells us that that cry was, it is finished. And then he gave up his spirit. He died. And it says, and at that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. What that says to us is that what the curtain represented was part of what was finished. So what was finished? What was finished when Jesus died and he said it's finished? What was finished? His life? Sure. His suffering? Yes. His sacrifice for us? What was finished? The power of sin over us? Yes. But there's more. The it's not just that. There's more to it. What was finished was represented by that curtain and that is that barrier. The curtain had always been there in the temple because God's presence resided in this particular place and no man could ever come into this place. The curtain to show that the barrier between God and man was done. It was finished, whatever the barrier was. If it's pain, if it's sin, if it's temptation, if it's hurt in your life, it, if it's your choices, whatever the barrier is, it is finished. If it's a pain that's been afflicted on you by your surroundings or by your family, by your friends, by the people around you, or by your choices, or whatever it is, it is not a barrier anymore. It's done. It's over. It's out of the way. Isaiah 53 it's a prophecy about Jesus. And he says this about him. He was despised. Jesus was despised. Have you ever felt like people look down on you? Anybody? Ever feel like people look down on you for some reason? Jesus felt that too. He was despised. He was rejected of men. Ever feel alone? Like you're in this all by yourself? Jesus did too. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Ever cried yourself to sleep at night? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid our faces from him. Ever had people deliberately avoid you? He was despised and we esteemed him not. Ever had somebody else take credit for something good you did? For some accomplishment that you made? Somebody else got the credit for it? Surely Jesus in his suffering and in his death has borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. Yet we said God did this to him. We saw him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. We said, this is God's doing. But the truth is, according to Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Let me tell you basically what this says. Because of what Jesus went through, we're healed. We're complete. 
We're whole. We are in right standing with God. And in Isaiah's day, when he was speaking these words, the curtain was still in the temple and there was still a barrier there. But God was making a way for us, even then, to say to us, I'm putting in front of you today this choice. You can choose life and prosperity, or you can choose death and destruction. So I'm calling you today to choose life. It's always been God's plan. Always. Let me tell you what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans as we get ready to close. This, I'm going to read this from the message because, well, I want you to hear this. It says, we throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We get to a point in our lives where we say, okay, I've mustered up enough courage. I think I took a shower this morning. I'm clean. I've, I, I haven't done these things in a few hours, so I, I'm pretty okay. I think I can come to God now. And we, we muster up the strength to, to creak the door open into God's presence to say, God, can, can I have a... Re is there a slight chance that I can have a relationship with you? And when we just crack the door open a little bit, we find out that the other side of it is already thrown open wide and God is already saying to us, you're welcome here. You can come in here. There is nothing that should be a barrier between you and me. The door is wide open. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand. Remember, this word of life is already in your heart. It's already a desire there. It's already in your mouth. You're already saying it. Could I please just live instead of exist? He says we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall, and shouting our praise. Can you imagine if your life wasn't so burdened? If your life was something more than just existing. If you could actually stand in a space where you were free. And you were wide open to where you, were, you knew you were standing in an acceptance by God's grace and in His glory. And you could even shout praise. Can you imagine that? Let me tell you how God looks at you. Another um, word from Isaiah is this. A bruised reed. Some of you, you know what a reed is, right? If you're in, in, um, on the edge of water. It's a really tiny, thin stalk that's hollow. It absorbs water, you know, takes water in. So it's, it's very fragile. Isaiah said that one of those reeds, a bruised reed, and he's not talking literally, he's talking about us. This is, a, this is a figure of us. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, but in faithfulness he will pour out justice. God knows what you've been through. He knows what has bruised you. He knows what is bending you over. He knows what the weight is caused by. And he doesn't come along and say, you know, you really ought to fix that and get yourself out from under that mess. No, God is coming in faithfulness to pour out justice. You might not see it. You might not understand it. But God is making everything right. Your choice isn't to make everything right. You don't have to do that. That's not your job. That's his job. Your choice is to choose life. Just to choose to live. What I'm telling you today, he says, is not hard. And it's not far from you. It's easy. It's an easy choice. All you have to do is choose it. Psalm 103 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's abounding in loving kindness and slow to anger. He won't always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger. 
He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a loving father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This morning, we have this choice to continue living our life as we always have, or to follow after God's plan. To just simply say, today, I want to choose to live. <clears throat> Did you hear anything in there that was hard? Was it too hard for you just to make a choice to live and then let God deal with the stuff? We stand before him and we know we don't deserve it. We know that there are things in our lives that are happening to us sometimes because of our choices. And it's my fault. I deserve this. I deserve to live like this. My mother lived this way. My grandmother lived this way. I guess I'll just always live this way. And we're constantly under this cloud. Today, on Easter Sunday, 2015, the grace of God can blow those clouds out of your life. So that you're standing in wide open space, free in the grace and the glory of God. I want to pray for you before we go today. Would you bow your heads? As you listen to this word today, maybe you feel that. I feel that urge within me. I, I really do want to make the right choice. I want to live in... I want to live and prosper instead of head my life toward death and destruction. And if you want to make that choice today, just pray with me. Just, just in the quietness of your heart. You don't have to say anything out loud. If you want to, you're welcome to. Um, but just pray this prayer with me. Lord, we, we thank you that you have offered us this irresistible gift of your love your grace, that we can come into a relationship with you that changes the tra trajectory of our lives, that we don't have to keep going as we've always been. We say to you, Lord, we want to follow you. Our hearts want to follow after you. Our hearts want to be free. We want to receive the gift that you offer us the forgiveness of our sins, and peace with God. The barriers that we've erected, thank you, Lord, that you see through them as if they're not even there. So we choose, Lord, to follow you today. We choose today to say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Remove my sins as far as the east is from the west. Help me to live free from this shame, from this pain. Lord, you get glory through my life. Instead of me always living in the shadow of what happened to me, or what I've done, let me live free so that the glory of your name is what other people see in me. The freedom I live in is because of your gift, because of your death on the cross, because of the power of your resurrection. You came out of the grave to prove to us that your offer is an offer of life. We accept it today by faith. Help us to live it through your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Oh, I want us to... Um... Hey, one day we'll have some chairs that, you know, or carpet or something. <laughs> um, we love being in this space. We're thankful to God that, that we get to um, experience the grace of God and the family of God here every Sunday. We are so glad with us today and we would love to see you back every week
or any time that you're in town, if you're visiting, um, thank you so much for being here. Can I ask you before we go, was there anybody that prayed that prayer with me this morning? Would you just raise your hand so, so we can give glory to God for that prayer? Have a great Easter and, and get your after church outfit on now, Amber. Um, if you would like to have prayer, we would love to pray for you before we go. If, if you would like to have prayer, um, we'll be at the front and you're welcome to come and let us pray with you. Um, I pray you have a blessed week. Thank you so much for being here. I want to give you a